I want to start by saying I have a handout that's being passed around, but I definitely did not print enough copies. This link uh, should take you to a digital version of the handout if you would prefer to see it that way. If you can't read it, it says tinyurl.com slash my last name, Grippo, and EB for extreme belief. So hopefully that works. Yeah. All right, I'm just going to start. Um, here are my main ideas, right? I want to say that conspiratorial thinking is not inherently epistemically vicious. I even want to make probably a much stronger claim, right, that most of it is not epistemically vicious at all. Um, so this is actually inspired by Ian James Kidd's concept of epistemic corruption, which, to quote you directly, occurs when one's epistemic character comes to be damaged due to one's interactions with persons, conditions, processes, doctrines, or structures that facilitate the development and exercise of epistemic vices. I want to suggest that oppression and persecution plays a fundamental part in the development of some conspiratorial thinking. However, diverging from Kidd, I argue that often conspiratorial thinking of the oppressed is not necessarily a corruption of epistemic character, right? I want to say that often it's not epistemically vicious. So to start, I'm just going to go over a little bit of the terminology that I'll be using, right? One of the biggest problems I've found with the current literature is that conspiracy, conspiracy theory, and conspiratorial thinking are often very loosely defined. Um, so conspiratorial thinking, right, includes a much wider variety of thinking than simply just conspiracy theory belief, right? Though conspiracy theory belief is by far the most troubling, which is why I'm focusing on it, of course. So to pull directly, right, conspiracy just means a secret plot by two or more powerful actors. Conspiracies typically attend um, in the political realm or economic realm. Uh, they violate rights, infringe upon established agreements, et cetera, et cetera. Conspiracy theories, on the other hand, right, are attempts to explain the ultimate causes of significant social and political events and circumstances um, with claims of secret plots by two or more powerful actors, right? This understanding of conspiracy theory says nothing about um, the truth value of the theory, right? It's indeterminate at this point. It's a theory. Um, this is to say, right, we often think of conspiracy theories as being just crazy, right? Like we think of the crazy ones right off the bat. And this is not necessarily always the case, right? It can turn out that some conspiracy theories will inevitably end up being true. So I just want to say that right off the bat, right? Conspiratorial thinking, on the other hand, is much broader, as I mentioned. Typically involves the belief in conspiracy theories, but can also describe a much broader type of thinking, right? Like it's a natural tendency towards assuming that there are powerful actors at play in a situation, making things worse in a situation, right? So here's my second point. What people often consider to be a conspiracy is oftentimes just simply standard practice. I have this in quotes because it comes directly from a conversation I had with David Lyons like a year ago when I was bringing up the conspiracy theory about the FBI or CIA killing Martin Luther King Jr., right? That's a conspiracy theory. Um, and I was just talking about, you know, obviously the conspiracy that the FBI was blackmailing MLK with tapes and such. Um, and I'll never forget the look on his face when he looked at me and said, well, that wasn't a conspiracy. That was just standard practice for the FBI. Um, and it's still a conspiracy, right? Like, I'm not going to, that doesn't, negate the definition of conspiracy or the fact that it fits in the definition of conspiracy, but it says something really valuable, right? That conspiracies, seemingly because they're so closely linked to conspiracy theories oftentimes when we think about them, tend to be seen as rarities or anomalies. Um, and reframing many conspiracies as just standard practice tends to better speak to how pervasive they can be, right? So the FBI blackmailing MLK was not like a lone incident of the FBI wielding their power against civil rights movements at the time, right? This was pretty much standard practice, despite the fact that it was secretive at, you know, secretive at the time. 
Second, relatedly, conspiracy theories are often treated as a unified category. And I think that this, this is a very key detail, right? This neglects quite a few details. So the first one I want to call out, right, is required conviction of a conspiracy theory. So some conspiracy theories demand more belief than others, right, or a stronger belief than others, right? There are some conspiracy theories like, I don't know if people have heard about the mattress firm stores being drug fronts or something like that, right? That's a silly kind of conspiracy theory um, that doesn't actually require us to change anything about our lives in order to believe it. And it really doesn't even demand that we believe it wholeheartedly, right? Like, I can kind of believe that as like a ha-ha, but as soon as I get any bit of counter evidence, right, I'm throwing it out, right? And there is counter evidence for this. I don't actually believe this, but <laughs> it's just an example. Relatedly, there's an element of how all-encompassing the conspiracy theories are, right? So like, for instance, QAnon demands significantly more of its believers than the mattress firm conspiracy. The mattress firm conspiracy, right, is like a localized thing. It doesn't really affect anything outside of thinking about mattress firm stores. QAnon, on the other hand, affects one's views of politics and politicians, people in Hollywood, certain medical facts and certain medical professionals, uh, business people. I mean, it affects like a whole range of what one has to believe, right? It changes a lot of a person's beliefs. It's not just one belief. Then there's the other element, right? And I think this is a very important one of what the conspiracy aims to explain, what the conspiracy theory aims to explain. So for instance, right, the conspiracy theory, which I'm still shocked that this is like at the level of theory of like the CIA planting crack in black neighborhoods right in the 80s. And um, that one like aims to explain something very, very different than the conspiracy theory of, say, 9-11 being an inside job, or the conspiracy theory of like the anti-Semitic anti conspiracy theory of New World Order, right? Something like that. Lastly, there is also this piece of like how much evidence there is for a certain conspiracy theory, right? Or also how, how much lack of evidence there is against it. This, I think, is also really crucial, right? There are just some that are more likely to be true than others. Um, this is not like they all have the same level of ability to be true. Um, and it's not impossible to suggest that some on their face are just more reasonable or more likely to give, or more likely than others given, given available evidence or lack thereof, right? So, okay, four basic principles of conspiracy theory belief, right? One is that they're consequential. So conspiracy theory belief affects the behavior of the believer, right? This is crucial, and I'll come back to this at the end as well. The second, universal. There has been no one time or place more affected by conspiracy theory beliefs. This is a contingent claim, I believe, not a necessary one. The third is that they're emotional, right? Um, they call it a paradox, that conspiracy theory belief is justified by elaborate arguments, but driven by aversive emotional experiences. And the fourth is that they are social. They're driven by an in-group, out-group distinction. And conspiracy theories reflect the basic structure of intergroup conflict, right? Those are four basic principles for conspiracy theory belief. So to dive into some of the psychology literature on this, I won't go too far into it because I'm not a psychologist and I'm not gonna purport to be one, right? Who is the typical conspiracy theory believer? They are more likely to be male, unmarried, less educated, have lower income, be unemployed, be a member of an ethnic minority group, and have weaker social networks. Why did I include this? Why is this important, right? So, at least in the US, when you think of a conspiracy theory believer, the person you're thinking about, more often than not, at least the people that I've talked to, right, are these, you know, the racist Trump-supporting QAnon, white guy sitting in his mom's basement on 8chan, like raging about <coughs> Jewish people taking over the world, right? Like that's the idea that came to mind. So this quote, reading this paper, actually got me thinking on the topic, right? Because the fact that uh, conspiracy theory believers are primarily or more so members of an ethnic minority group 
than this sort of average racist white guy, right? At least in the US, of course, says, speaks to something that I didn't consider before this, right? Okay, second, second part. One study showed that while recognition of past anti-black conspiracies was greater among African-American participants than European-American participants, and this greater recognition was associated with an increased ratings of informant credibility and plausibility regarding a contemporary anti-black conspiracy. Exposure to information about past anti-black conspiracies can be sufficient to lead European Americans to express less extreme disagreement about the plausibility of present anti-black conspiracies. Why is this important, right? The language of the study makes the connection sound rather tenuous, of course, but it shows that for the in-group affected directly by past conspiracies, knowledge of those conspiracies makes them more likely to trust information with regard to new conspiracy theories, related conspiracy theories. The other important piece is that even the outgroup who were not af directly affected by the past conspiracies become at the very least more sympathetic to, in this case, anti-black conspiracy theory believers when they become aware of the, the past anti-black conspiracies, right? Okay, so I'm gonna talk now about trust and distrust and how this plays a role, because I think this is really crucial, right? So I ascribe to Karen Jones's understanding of trust as an effective attitude, meaning that trust has a dual focus, right? Trust requires both an initial reliance on someone's goodwill and competence, of course, and a reliance on them recognizing and responding positively to my vulnerability at the hands of their agency, right? So it needs both of those things. Distrust on this picture is not merely the absence of trust, right? But it's an attitude of pessimism towards the other party's um, goodwill, competence, and responsiveness. Since both trust and distrust are effective attitudes, right? They are sustained and grown by effective looping. Trust and distrust reinforce themselves in our minds by shaping how we interpret the world and finding new grounds for the justification of trusting and distrusting effect. All right, here's the picture of how this looping distrust functions in the mind of an oppressed person, right? I'm gonna give you a case. Lindsay is a woman and therefore a member of an oppressed group. She holds a pessimistic attitude towards the United States government's goodwill, competence, and responsiveness to her reliance. In June of 2022, right, the US Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade, thereby removing the federal right to have an abortion. Lindsay interprets this incident, I'll call it, as confirmation that her distrust is well-placed, right? So Lindsay's distrust in the United States government grows. Now, this is a very simple case, right? The distrust was already directed at the government and confirmed by the actions of the government. However, the cases need not be the simple to still function with the same justificatory force. For instance, Lindsay could be distrustful of the United, face, United States because she faced gendered violence and or gendered marginalization perpetuated by individual men rather than the United States government. But if the government, a uniquely empowered entity tasked with the goal of protecting its citizens from harm and determining which harms are redressable, fails to protect her and or fails to provide her with a legal avenue for redress, then pessimism towards the government's goodwill, competence, and responsiveness to her reliance is also warranted and justified, right? And now the concern with this kind of trust, and especially distrust, being an effectively looping force, is that A, it can be easily manipulated by bad actors. We see this all the time, of course. In Karen Jones's paper, she talks about Trump being one of these bad actors and the rhetoric around immigration and crime. But B, also, because the mechanism of looping means that one is looking for justification for their trust and distrust, subjects of looping can find and be satisfied with the mere appearance of justification. If the mere appearance of justification takes the place of real justification, i.e., right, genuine reasons to be pessimistic about the other party's goodwill, competence, and responsiveness to reliance, then we have a problematic and unjustified form of distrust that can lead the subject mistrusting an untrustworthy person simply because the untrustworthy person distrusts the same people, right? And this also happens quite a bit. So 
this fear of looping distrust is warranted, right? We see it play out all the time. Karen Jones talks about like perfect examples of how dangerous this can be. But I want to say that this is often, and I want to say that this is often at play in vicious forms of conspiratorial thinking, because vices in one's thinking will typically lead to accepting the appearance of justification, right? If one's gullible or intellectually lazy, they're going to accept whatever tenuous form of appearance of justification for their distrust they hear first, right? However, I also want to say we should be careful not to discredit the distrust of the oppressed on these grounds simply because this kind of unjustified distrust loop is rampant in society. If our oppressed subject, Lindsay, begins to take more innocuous acts, like smiles from men on the street, as reasons to distrust all men, then we run into a problem, of course. But this is not necessarily the standard case when injustice, harassment, and acts of violence are constantly committed against women and femme-perceived people, right? More often than not, Lindsay is effectively respons responding in kind to legitimate acts of oppression. With real everyday harms being committed against oppressed people, there arises reasons for the oppressed to be distrustful of both the oppressive group and the government that is tasked with protecting them. Though often, right, those are not mutually exclusive groups. <laughs> I just want to say, governments are often afflictors of oppression as well, right? So we can frame this kind of unjustified distrust and justified distrust as parallels to paranoia and hypervigilance. This is where I'm going to take it. So I have to talk about paranoia, right? Because when you talk about conspiracy theory belief, you're thinking of the Hofstadter paper, the original, the paranoid style in American politics. Um, you can think of sort of like an Adorno understanding of paranoia. But I want to claim that what is felt when one is affected by the effective looping of distrust is similar to something like a hypervigilance, right? Hypervigilance is just the elevated state of constantly assessing potential threats around you. So hypervigilance is a protective mechanism usually associated with the presence of past trauma, right? This is the clinical form of it. Um, it's primarily bodily, and it can be said to be driven by fear or anxiety. And it's rational to be wary of new trauma when one has been subjected to similar traumas and remains in the same kind of environment. The key distinction between hypervigilance and paranoia is that hypervigilance is localized, right? So my friend, a veteran with PTSD, Right, is going to be hypervigilant around noises that can be mistaken for explosions and gunshots, but not really much else. Right, Anything that reminds me of wartime activity, yes, but not, not outside of that. Now, I want to be very, very clear here. Right, I'm not trying to pathologize depressed peoples. I don't want to say that oppression leads to a form of PTSD or anything similar or clinical. I'm taking a clinical term and transforming it to be used in a social way, right? I think this is helpful for guiding the understanding of how felt that like anxiety can be, especially with forms of distrust. But that being said, we can see the parallel, right? The standard practices of oppression and persecution function similarly to trauma in that they're often violent or backed by the threat of violence should one resist. Therefore, one who has experienced the harm of oppression and persecution is similarly hypervigilant so as to protect themselves from future harm and is civil similarly driven by this sort of fear or anxiety. So hypervigilance also maps on quite well, right, to the studies and analysis listed above. If conspiracy theory is so is conspiracy theory belief is social in the ways presented, and knowledge of past conspiracies contributes to the belief in current conspiracy theories, then we can posit that the avoidance of harm via hypervigilance and looping distrust is at play here. Hypervigilance, as based in fear and anxiety, also speaks to the emotional component of conspiracy theory belief as well. Now, on to the epistemic viciousness and corruption, right? So the problem I want to say with a vice epistemology analysis of conspiratorial thinking is that it assumes too much and focuses too heavily on the individual without factoring things like social status and oppressions and how those affect reasoning, right? So I think it's evident at this point, right? I'm a pluralist about modes of reasoning. I don't think there's only one good way to reason, right? Um, there is simply no reason to assume, right, one is convicted enough in a conspiracy theory belief that they are closed-minded to counter evidence, right? This is actually more about the conspiracy theory than the person believing it, probably. 
right? Like our friend Oliver, the 9-11 truther, might be close-minded, but it's baseless to universalize that across all types of conspiracy theories and all types of conspiracy theory believers. For instance, recall the mattress firm example again. If we don't treat conspiracy theories as a monolith, then we can see some are significantly more inconsequential than others just on the face of it. Um, the mattress firm theory is just not that important, right? I'll say that. But even take some of the harder cases, the JFK assassination, for example, this again comes back to trust and distrust, which trust and distrust, and which sources are relevant and reliable to be trusted, right? Closed mindedness as a vice requires one to have an unwillingness or inability to engage seriously with relevant intellectual options. If we have justified reason to distrust a source, then we have justified reason to ignore that source as a relevant intellectual option. Right? There's simply too much information in the world, and this is talked about in the literature on closed mindedness. Right? We have to be, in some sense, closed mindedness. We can't take everything. But it doesn't necessarily reach the point of vicious closed mindedness until we're turning off relevant options. And so what I'm saying here is that when there is a warranted form of distrust, right, you're not closing off relevant options for you. Okay. Gullibility, on the other right, similarly overgeneralized. Believing something about the state of the world because one has been victim to a similar pattern in the past is decidedly different from believing whatever comes one's way or trusting all or any sources. In fact, right, I'd argue, and I hope this isn't contentious, but it likely will be, right? Someone who is aware of past conspiracies on the part of some organization, say like the United States CIA, right, um, is likely more gullible to continue believing the CIA than distrusting the CIA, right? Like if you know that the CIA is this like shadow organization that consistently lies to the population of the US, like of the US, right? It's seemingly kind of absurd to continue believing what the CIA says if they say they haven't done something, right? Okay, of course, none of this absolves one's gullibility if they then go and just believe whomever, right? This is, this is a separate thing, but that's quite a leap to say one's distrust certain sources and then claiming they must instead trust other wrongful sources, right? And similar things can be said about other epistemic vices, typically associated with conspiratorial thinking, dogmatism, laziness, and thought, right? In fact, working with a starting point of distrust rather than trust pretty much rules out dogmatism initially, but it can come into play later, of course, and certainly points against laziness and thought, kind of like that question that came from over here before about the like idea of these people being free thinkers now, right? Like it's not a laziness, it's not that they're not trying to do research, it's just that they're doing the wrong research at this point. Um, yeah. So I also wanna say, right, the epistemic corruption theory similarly neglects this type of reasoning happening in these cases. I don't think what I'm saying is adversarial to the theory, not per se, not just saying that because you're sitting here, um, but I do think that they can work together, right? I do think there is a form of conspiratorial thinking that does, that does factor into this sort of corruption, and then there's a type that doesn't necessarily do so. Um, it assumes that the oppressive features of society harm the oppressed epistemic character, thus either instilling epistemic vices in them or right strengthening, securing, widening the scope of epistemic vices they already have. But this does not necessarily map onto these cases if the reasoning for belief in these conspiracy theories is something like harm avoidance, self-protection that evades succumbing to the, the vicious reasoning in the first place. Okay, some final remarks, right? The line of demarcation, right? To whom does this analysis apply? Who is a member of an oppressed group? When I first started thinking about this, uh, my friend, she's from Appalachia, she was like, well, Appalachians should be considered an oppressed group, right? Because basically um, businesses have gone in and colonized the region and then pulled out, right? Something like oppression of sorts. Um, and those, right, the Appalachian group of people does seem to be sort of like the racist Trump supporting conspiracy, like the QAnon people, right? So I don't know if I can say where the line is, right? I think it's murky. 
I also don't want to be the person to say the line. I don't, I don't think I'm qualified for that, right? Um, I think sometimes being murky is okay. <laughs> and then lastly, right? I also actually, before I go to the last final remarks, I do want to say, I think a lot of this actually comes down to more about the conspiracy theory itself, um, rather than the identity of the person, right? I think they're both at play, but the conspiracy theory, the type of conspiracy theory is a, is a big part of this. Okay, final remarks. If most conspiratorial thinking in what I'm trying to say is not epistemically vicious, why do we have such an aversion to it and blame those who engage in it? All right, I think two things are going on here, right? One, if we, if we want to say that beliefs can wrong, then many of the most popular conspiracy theories demand that their believers commit doxastic wrongs, right? So like anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, right? That is wronging Jewish, those are wronging Jewish people. The Sandy Hook believing that that's a fraud case, right? That's wronging the families of the, the Sandy Hook, the Sandy Hook massacre, right? And then two, since conspiracy theory belief is consequential, right? Meaning these beliefs influence decision making, we are conflating the moral harms done by actions based on conspiracy theory belief with the mode of thinking itself, right? We're trying to look back because we're so focused on the actions most of the time and we're trying to say, where are these coming from? Why are they happen? And then we're positing that the reasoning has gone wrong and this is what should be blamed. Okay, I will end it there. Thank you.